welcome to the fourth video lecture in week 5 so we were we have been looking at induction for the last two weeks so before that we looked at various other proof techniques how to prove a statement like a implies b using constructive proof contradiction controversy and counter example but for certain problems in discrete mathematics proving it by induction is a very useful uh, attempt, approach. So the main idea is that one can split up the assumption into possibly infinite number of subsets. This implies that the problem A implies B gets split into and of infinitely many problems. They are usually parameterized by some parameter of the input. So the problem A implies B is same as P1 and P2 and so on till infinity. So this problem A implies B thus becomes for all k proof Pk is true. Now one cannot go about proving all the problems individually because there are infinitely many of them. So one has to come up with a cleverer way of solving it. The idea is that first of the problem the first case, namely P1, and then solve that for all k, if you can solve Pk is true, then solve Pk plus 1 is true. By doing so, you will be able to hopefully prove for all n Pl is true. Because you have proved P1 is true, and 1 is true, therefore 2 is true, the 2 is true, therefore 3 is true, and so on. So if you go on like that, you will end up proving Pn is true for all n greater than or equal to 1. So, to, so the fact that by doing so we will be able to prove for all n is guaranteed by what is known as principle of mathematical induction which basically states that proving for all k greater than or equal to 1 Pk it is sufficient to prove P1 and then for proof that for all k greater than or equal to 1, pk implies pk plus 1. Now this is the most basic form of principle of mathematical induction. You can get a quite a number of different versions of this. And depending on the problem, we might have to choose the right version to it. So we have gone over a few of the versions, let me go over them again. To start with we have the first version, the basic version, which says that to prove k is greater than or equal to 1, pk is true. We have the base case, which is proving that p1 is true. The induction hypothesis says that pk is true for some k greater than or equal to 1. And the inductive test says that assuming induction hypothesis proves pk plus 1. The version 2 basically says that we can change the base case to some other number r and that would imply that for all k greater than or equal to r, pk is true. So for proving that k is greater than or equal to r, pk is true, we have to start with the base case which is pr and then the rest of them remaining the same will do. But sometimes proving the inductive state that means Proving pk is true implies pk plus 1 is true can be complicated. One might have to prove pk is true, therefore pk plus 2 is true, or something like that. So, in that case, we have to come up with a new version of that. So, here is one of them that prove pr and pr plus 1 is true, and then I mean pk is true, prove pk plus 2 is true. Now, for all of them, as I have repeated many, many times in the last few lectures, you should ensure that all the cases are satisfied. As long as you can ensure that all the cases are covered, it is fine. It is, you can convince yourself that all the various versions ensure that. So if you can ensure that all the cases are covered, then we have the proof of the whole problem. So we also have this, uh, another version which says that if you cannot prove that pk implies pk plus 2, but maybe we can prove it that if pk and pk plus 1 is true, then pk plus 2 is true, then also we 
get the same result. So these are different versions and depending on the problem or depending on what can you do using the inductive step, we have to choose a different version. The problem can have more than one parameter and in that case we might have to induct on multiple parameters and again there are quite a number of different versions that one can apply. Here also since we are dealing with multiple parameters the goal is to ensure that all the possible points are covered which in this case is the two dimensional V. So in other words, if you have to prove that for all PQ, the problem parameters like PQ is true. There are various ways of doing it. So one of them is say prove that one for Q is true. And then assuming that the problem is true for the parameter P comma Q, prove that you can prove it for P plus one comma Q. Note that this will ensure that all the points in the two-dimensional grid is covered and hence we have the whole answer, whole proof. We can also have different versions here. For example, we can start with a different base case that means 1, Q, 1, Q and P, 1 are both sort, uh, base cases and then if P, Q is true then P plus 1, Q plus 1 is true this will also be a sufficient condition for it. Or as we saw in another example, we can also induct on P plus Q. That means if P plus Q less than or equal to K is true, then if I can prove that for all P prime comma P Q prime, but P prime plus Q prime is K plus 1 is true, then we have the whole problem again. One more example that we have been going on that I will tell you is the if we induct on minimum of P comma Q and so on. So, so it is clear that there are quite a number of versions and the versions can be you can yourself change the version you can yourself choose the different version. All that you have to do is that you have to choose the inductive hypothesis which will help us prove the inductive state and ensure that all the cases are covered. In the last video we saw a very interesting application of this induction where we could solve the AMDM inequality which was clearly a pretty complicated problem and we solved it using applying an induction version which we didn't even have at that time. We called it the backward induction. Now, this mathematical induction can also be useful for solving not only just discrete problems like number theory problems and so on, it can also be used to solve combinatorial problems. Now, what do I mean by combinatorial problems? Problems which deal with combinatorial objects, not, not just numbers. So, here is a simple problem. So you have a 2n cross 2n, uh, 2 power n cross 2 power n room with the, the pillar in one corner. So that means you have a room which is something like this. It's a, the dimension of this one is, this is 2 power n feet. Dimension of this one is also same, 2 power n feet. And of course, this is broken up into uh, various kind of uh, into tiles or um, uh, grids kind of stuff. Right? Something like this. It's a, we have a flow. I've just, I'm just drawing a grid structure over here. And there is a there is a pillar at one of the corners. So that means this corner 
is covered with the pillar. So you cannot do anything with the corner. So your room looks like this. It's a, almost a square except that one corner, one square foot is gone. Now you have a tile. A tile is basically something of this form. You have a one cross one cross one tile. An edge shaped tile that you have. And the question is that can you use this particular tile to cover the whole floor? You are not allowed to break the tile. You are not allowed to leave any space of the floor uncovered. So you have to use exactly that many number of tiles. A proof that for all n you can successfully tile the whole floor. Okay, so let's do some quick checks here. First of all, a tile covers three squares, right? And how many squares are there in the whole room? It is 2 power n times 2 power n minus 1, which is 4 power n minus 1. Now, if I have to cover the whole room using this 3, uh, this L shaped tile, I have to ensure that, I have to first, I mean, this must happen that 4 must divide 4n, 3 must divide 4n minus 1. Now, is this true? Now I leave it to you guys as an exercise to prove that, so prove this statement that 3 does divide 4n plus uh, minus 1, 3 does divide 4n minus 1. So it is possible that maybe we can use this red colored L shaped tile to cover the whole floor. But just because 3 divides 4n minus 1, it's not necessarily, not necessary that we would be able to cover the whole floor, right? Say for example, let's take a quick example here. If instead say I have of instead of this 2 power n, 2 power n, I have a 5 cross 5. So 1, 2. If this is my room that I have, And the corner room, corner floor is come is not there. This is a five cross five floor, five feet cross five feet. I have this one cross one tile, and it is you can check that there are twenty four available squares. Three divides twenty four. But if I want to tile this whole space using the three cross one tile, let's try and solve it. Maybe, okay, I can put one here, yeah, I can put one here, I can put one here, I can put maybe one here, put one here, I can put one here, I can put maybe one here, but then see this three here, I cannot, because this tile is of the shape L, I will not be covered, able to cover these three things. Right? Because I, uh, if I have to cover these three spaces using this L shaped tile, I have to break this tile. And that's not allowed. So, it is not that obvious that, so it's, in fact, it is clear from the example that just if the number of space allowed and available is divisible by 3, you can divide by, you can tile it using this 3, using this L shaped tile. The problem says that if the instead of 5, which is not 2 power n, 
for is not a power of n, it's pi. Instead of that, if I have 2 power n cross 2 power n size room, then we will be able to solve tile it using the, this particular tile. Right? So, how do we do it? So, we have to, of course, give a tile for that. We have to show that a particular tiny exists. So we will prove this particular problem using induction. Of course, to start with, let's look at the two some simple cases n equals to 1. Now n equals to 1, that means 2 power n is 2, that means the floor looks like a 2 cross 2 feet floor with one of the corner not available, like this is not there and I have a tile which is actually exactly the size of the floor. So if n equals to 1, then the tile itself is the shape and size of the floor, so I can just take this tile and put it there. And so n equals to 1 is good. Right? What about this n equals to 2? Meaning 2 power 2 is 4. So I have this 4 by 4 shape floor with this corner not there. And how do I use this one to tie it? Let's see, can I tie it? Now, again, there can be quite a number of ways of tying it, possibly. For example, maybe I might be able to tie it like this. No, this will not work. That's kind of clear because then I will not be able to tie this too. Hmm. So, what ex another example? Let's see. Let's make another attempt to tie it. And if this one is not there. So maybe what I can do is that I can tile this like this, I can tile it like this, this, this. Hmm, okay, this looks interesting. So I am able to tile it like this. So the n equals to 2 case also can be tiled. Right? I've tiled it using 5 of this tile. No two of them are overlapping and I have covered the whole space. Now this is for the case of n equals to 2. Can I do anything about anything else? n equals to for general length? The idea is of course, since n is the only integer here that we have, we can interact on n. And if we induct on him, how does it look like? So, here is the big floor that I have. This, this shape is 2 power n. This shape is again 2 power n. And the corner square is not there. How do I use a different case? Now, Okay, one technique too is to let's split up this whole floor into two parts, or rather, sorry, into four parts. I split one in the middle and this way. Now, what do I have? Now, each of them is of the size 2 power n minus 1, because I split it into two parts, into 2 power n minus 1. Thus, I have broken 
the bigger instance into a smaller instance. I have taken the floor when the floor is of size 2 power n, we have broken up into to the case where floor is of size 2 power n minus 1. And now, if I use induction, for example, if I assume that the floor of size 2n minus 1 times 2n minus 1 with one of the corner missing can be timed, then can I use it to time this particular example or the, 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 the nth case? Now here, what we can do is that we can put a tile, single tile at the corner here. Now if I put it at the corner, that means this one, note that the remaining, that means this space of the shaded space that I am drawing is a 2n cross 2, 2n minus 1 cross 2n minus 1 square with the corner missing. And this gives us the idea for the induction. Now if using induction, we can say, or the induction hypothesis says that for case n minus 1, I can tie it using some way. So there is some way of tying this particular thing. There is some way of styling this particular thing, and there is some way of styling this particular thing. Note that all the three squares and the square are all basically the same structure, meaning a 2n. 2 power n minus 1, 2 power n minus 1 with 1 square missing. All of them are exactly of this structure, just rotated. So, if I, if I know how to tie the 2n minus 1 plus 2n minus 1 flow, then I will be able to use it to tie the 2n, 2 power n flow. So, in other words, using the n minus 1 case, I can solve the n. So idea is that I take the instance, the problem instance of the n and break it down into smaller instance which are the n minus 1 instances and I can use the induction hypothesis now to solve it. Right? So What did we get? So we have that the base case n equals to 1, we can solve it trivially. And if we assume the n minus 1 case, we can solve the nth case. Recall this is exactly the version 1. We have applied the version 1 to the version 1 of the induction hypothesis to this particular combinatorial problem. And using that, we have solved the whole problem. So this is a typical application of induction on combinatorial objects. The idea is take the combinatorial objects with parameter n and somehow break it down or reduce it to smaller instances. So here we have to use the induction hypothesis to prove the tagging problem. In the coming weeks, we will be seeing a lot more other combinatorial objects and how to solve many of the problems using induction. To start, so for that we will need to come up with a different language of talking about combinatorial objects and this that is what we will be calling graphs. So next week we will be introducing graph theory and then solve a lot of problems in graph theory. Thank you.